Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here at ARM with Rob Aitken, an ARM Fellow, and we're going to talk today about near-threshold computing. It's a technology concept that's been talked about for a while, but never actually been implemented commercially. Rob, what exactly is near-threshold computing to start with, and then why has it taken so long to actually catch on? Excellent question. So near-threshold computing is operating a processor just slightly above the threshold voltage of the transistors. So that's kind of in the 300 to 400 millivolt range for a lot of conventional CMOS processes. I think it's taken so long to catch on because it's just actually fairly hard to do. So in, in a lot of cases, there really hasn't been the motivation to do all the, the work that's required, and the, in some cases, the EDA structure and the IP structure to support it hasn't been there either. So with the sort of recent prominence of the Internet of Things, near-threshold compute is a, a lot more interesting and a lot more viable than it's been in the past. So I think that's why there's increased interest in it at the moment. So why don't you draw out some of the complication here, exactly what are we dealing with and what are the benefits? Okay, let's do that. So let's first of all look at a couple of phenomena that I think are important. So if we take a look at here a voltage versus power curve. Dynamic power as you drop the voltage tends to go down sort of what we tend to think of it as CV squared F. Power tends to work as CV squared F, where C is the capacitance, V is the voltage, and F is the frequency. Now what we can see is as we drop the voltage, the, the capacitance and the voltage squared part goes down. What happens differently is that the frequency also degrades. So as we drop the voltage, if we have a different curve here, frequency versus voltage, then as we drop the voltage, the frequency also drops. And it drops very rapidly. So in a typical near threshold environment, the, the operating frequency might be only one one thousandth of what it is at nominal voltage. So there's say a, a thousand X difference here in frequency. And that means that we need to take a look at the energy consumption rather than strictly the power consumption. So one of the benefits here is that you can actually do this at some of the existing nodes instead of having to move everything down one, the next node, the next node, the next node, right? Absolutely. And in many cases, operating at some of these higher or older nodes is beneficial because the SRAM operates and different, doesn't have as many vmin problems and so on. And we'll talk a little bit about that coming up. So if we put these two curves together, we can kind of get an energy curve, which looks something like this. So we have voltage here, and we have energy over here. If we're assuming a low power process so that the leakage is at nominal significantly less than the dynamic power, we see the dynamic portion of the energy looks something like this as we drop voltage. So it's mostly linear as we get lower. As you lower the voltage, the frequency goes down, but the power goes down as well, and so you have this sort of relationship here. On the other hand, the leakage power, which we can draw here, tends to have the opposite behavior. That at nominal voltage and at even reasonably low voltages, leakage power isn't very significant in an LP process. But as we get to this point here where we're starting to ramp up this curve, the reason that this is happening is the frequency is slowing down so much that the device is actually running more and more of the time. So over here, it might be running you know, less than 1% of the time, but down here, it's starting to run more and more until it gets to this point where it's essentially running all the time, that there's no way to finish the computation if you go any slower. This is, and that means that the leakage is starting to dominate the dynamic power, as you see here in this curve, and that leads to sort of the total energy curve looking something like this. And you can see that it starts to decrease and then it starts to ramp up again when you pass below a sort of minimum energy point. So this is the min E point. And this min E point is really the near threshold point. And that we can say the, the VT for the device is somewhere in this neighborhood and the minimum energy point is the one that we care about. Can you lower the overall power budget by using this technique? 
Another good question, yeah, can we lower the power budget? And the answer is we can. If we look at sort of the values here, the value at this min, er min energy point, say we call this X, and then this point up here is probably on the order of four to six X in terms of overall energy consumption. Now this, interestingly enough, the, the actual relationship of the power depends again on this combination of frequency and so on. But the energy from a battery operated device standpoint is really the key. So what we're seeing here is that by operating at this near threshold point, we can get four to six X improvement in energy. Now that doesn't come for free because we actually have to make some design changes in order to allow the design to operate down at this low energy point. And so we'll talk about some of those coming up. Because again, if we do this wrong, then actually the overhead that we have to add in order to get the savings um, is more than you actually get in terms of the benefit. So it's very important to do this part well. well how does this affect, I mean, we, we're talking about power, but how does this affect performance, which is the, the flip side of that? Yeah, and, and it, we can go back to the frequency curve here to so, show that essentially when we're operating in these low um, energy points, we are operating at a significantly lower frequency. So if we have an application that requires this maximum frequency point at nominal operating, there's no way that we can slow it. If we run it at this much lower speed, we're really slowing it down, possibly to the point where it's no longer interesting. So the normal realm of dynamic voltage and frequency scaling is more in this range, where we don't, we don't get down to this super near threshold point. So the, the near threshold type stuff, I think, is more appropriate for Internet of Things type applications, where essentially the device is spending most of its time asleep. It wakes up, does something, and then goes back to sleep. What's the latency on that on wake up versus a different type of chip? Uh, yeah, that latency question is another good one, and it's essentially design dependent. You have to, you have to design a power controller in such a way that it's able to wake up and appropriately do things. And there's there's various ways to do that. Again, depending on what your application is, you may it you may choose to simply have a time based method that wakes up once a minute, does something, goes back to sleep for another minute, or you may choose an event triggered. Um, operation and again depending on exactly what it's doing then you have to be careful about how the the wake-up process works so for example if you had a security camera and it needed to wake up take a picture of something that a motion detector had found record the video and stream it somewhere that has a different wake-up profile than say a temperature sensor that just needs to check and see if the temperature has changed by a degree or two and it doesn't matter if it's off by a second or two and when it takes that temperature measurement whereas in the video camera if it's off by two seconds then whatever was there is gone and is no longer of interest so you see this rolling into um, most of the commonplace applications that people are going to interact with on a regular basis this is not just the most advanced processor trying to eke out the best performance and the lowest power. This is basically a commonly used technique that's going to show up everywhere. I think it will eventually because the, this is a sort of a microcontroller Internet of Things type of system that you want to build. These, these are what's envisaged as being the leaf nodes in the Internet of Things. So there will be billions and billions of these things, as Carl Sagan might say. What we want to have is we want to have a system that's able to operate at this low energy point. It's not performance sensitive, so we can trade off the frequency that it's operating. And it's also not necessarily operating off an energy harvester. It's operating off a battery for near threshold. In sub-threshold regime is more appropriate for a harvester type of application. And the reason there is simply that Something operating off solar power, for example, has a limited current that it's going to operate on, but it has essentially an infinite supply at that current. It can produce 50 microamps or whatever forever, whereas a battery produce, has a fixed amount of energy inside it and has to use that efficiently.